there are always at least two answers to a question, depending upon which angle uh, you view it. Because if you ask the general public, I think you'd get a variety of answers to this. You've probably got the pessimist, the optimist, and the one who doesn't really care. So the pessimist, you're buried six foot under the ground and that's it. You rot and that's it. You've had your life, 70 years, that's it. Then you've got the optimist stroke pessimist. No, they are either in hell, burning, or they're in heaven, where it's all nice and peaceful. And then you get the third, who don't really know, not really bothered, that they, they might be there, then on the other hand, they might not. And so where do we come in this as Christadelphians? Well, death really is a, it's an unusual subject and many people who don't share a religious persuasion tend to hold the view that there is probably something after death, maybe reincarnation or something of that ilk, but not really sure. Quite a few of the mainstream religions around us believe that we don't die per se, but our souls remain alive and we either go to heaven or we go to hell. So which of these views uh, is correct? Well, we're going to look at the Bible this afternoon and the Bible is going to tell us where we stand uh, on this viewpoint. So let us ask ourselves a question. Do we go to heaven when we die? Well, let's go, uh, if you can, to the Gospel of John and, uh, and chapter 3. And we talked about this gentleman uh, earlier um, by way of exhortation, but in John chapter 3 and verse 13, it plainly says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And so that's something that's quite clear, isn't it? Nobody has ascended into heaven. John tells us that. So if our reward isn't in heaven, then where is it? And Jesus tells us, doesn't he, in, the, in what people call the Lord's Prayer, you know, um, we worship God, give honour and glory to his name, on earth as it is in heaven. Our reward isn't in heaven, but it's on the earth. The difference being is that the reward, that the reward comes from heaven to the righteous on the earth in the kingdom. And while we're in John chapter 3, let's just take a look at verse 3. Because we've got this man called Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, who came to Jesus by night. Um, he was quite an intelligent guy. He was. He knew his scriptures, or so he thought. And then in verse 3 he says, Jesus answered said unto him, Verily, verily, I'll say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I'll say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so in verse 15, we read, don't we, that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish, but have eternal life. So eternal life comes through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing about going to heaven and receiving a, re a reward. Our reward will be through the Lord Jesus Christ if we believe uh, on him. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
And so we can see here from the words of Jesus that he wants us to have eternal life. He wants us to live forever in his kingdom. But it's not going to be done in heaven. It's going to be done on the earth. Verse 36 of John chapter 3. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. And he, he, who, he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so we have this everlasting life. And this everlasting life can only be given to those in his kingdom, which will be on the earth. The general idea amongst most churches is that we possess an immortal soul, which can't die. When you die, they say that we have an indestructible soul clothed in an earthly body. Our bodies obviously decay and, are, and, uh, and is corrupted in the ground, but our souls being immortal, carry on. I was quite amazed uh, when I looked into uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. I was quite amazed at what I read. Uh, man is not a composite of two ultimately incom incompatible parts that struggle together in this life while awaiting separation at death. The Bible view allows no Gnostic dualism of body and spirit, the one evil and the other good, but stresses rather the unity of the human self and the terms flesh and spirit are moral. They indicate the kind of a person a man or a woman is, whether dominated by selfish desires or godly interests, rather than representing distinguishing parts of a man. In the Bible, the word soul, both in the Greek and in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament and New Testament, is synonymous with self or life, and often refers to the whole person. The soul is not eternal, pre-existing and later reincarnated, but is created uh, by God. Also, the person who wrote that knew his Bible. Because in English terms, this can be seen in the expression, can't it? Save our souls. So what does the Bible say? We always have to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Where we read of the creation uh, of man. And in verse 7, he says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, a man became a living soul, or as some versions of it, a living being. It's not an immortal soul. You will never find the words immortal and soul together in the scriptures. The word soul in the New Testament scripture is used basically in five realms. Uh, which I got from somebody who wasn't a Christadelphian, but he obviously uh, read his Bible. And it can be checked out by looking uh, in any concordance. Uh, first of all, it is used of the animal kingdom. It is used, secondly, of a man as an individual. Just as we say, a ship has gone down with every soul uh, on board. Thirdly, it is used of the life of a man which can be lost, can be destroyed, can be saved, or be laid down. Fourthly, it emphasizes the pronoun of myself, referring to a human being. And it expresses all the powers of one's being. And there's other instances that I think there's another five, which all point in the same uh, direction. And when you start to look at uh, the word immortal, it's, you know, it's used quite a lot, isn't it? Especially in sporting terms, you know, uh, they've reached immortality in, in the eyes of, uh, um, of the pantheon of sportsmanship and the like. And it's taken out of context, isn't it? Because that's not what immortality is about. That's what man thinks what immortality is. And... Also, if, as it uh, states, 
that it is used of the animal kingdom, we don't hear churches speaking of cats or dogs having immortal souls. Yet it's the same word used. We, we have the same spirit, the same breath that God has given us when we were born, in the, as in the animal kingdom. And so nobody talks about a dog being immortal, do they? Uh, I've had a few cats and dogs, and they're six foot under the ground, and probably one day I will be. But shall we go shall we to Psalm 49, middle of our Bibles? Psalm 49. Verse 7 and 8. And again, when we start to look at all of this, we can see that the message of the Bible is centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see it here. Verse, uh, verse 7. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases for ever. So it ceases. Something ceases, it's dead. It's mortal. It can't be immortal, can it? And if we go to uh, Ezekiel, um, chapter 18, it tells us quite clearly um, in verse 4, And notice here of the power of God. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. Everything comes from God. And then it says the soul that sins, it dies. Quite clear. Because everything comes from God. God gives and God takes away. That's what the scriptures uh, tell us. And of course, we die because of our sin. So we are not and do not have an immortal soul. And we see it again, don't we, in verse, uh, in verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness, of, uh, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The soul that sins, it dies. Quite clear. Jeremiah, just a few pages back in the book of Jeremiah, and chapter 31, verse 30. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Sin. That's why we die. Our soul, our spirit, our life force is no more because of our sin. But you might say, well, there are some problem passages, though, aren't there? And one of them is in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10 and verse uh, 28, where he says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, which rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. People say, well, man has got an indestructible soul clothed in an earthly body. But we have to look at verse 22 and verse 23 you know, for context. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. But when, the pers but when they uh, persecute you in this city, flee you to another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the city of Israel till the Son of Man be come. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking about being saved. And so, first of all, the immortal soul to destroy both soul and body. And the word hell there is Gehenna. It's the refuse dump where they used to throw bodies and the, and the, and the rubbish from out of Jerusalem. He's saying you might not be able to kill the soul, 
fear not for that, for the instant in which um, it kills the body, but are not able to destroy you utterly and finally. And this is why people seem to think they go to heaven when they die, because there's something there after life. So let's go show to Colossians and chapter 3. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. This was written quite a few years after Jesus ascended to his father, because he then, as now, he sits on his right hand. He's waiting for the call from his father to come back to set up his kingdom. But it tells us to set our affections on the things of above, not on the things on the earth. But he tells the believers, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So Jesus is going to appear. Jesus is coming back. We don't go up to meet Jesus in heaven. We will meet Jesus on the earth because the resurrection will take place on and in the earth because that's where the bodies are. They are in the ground. And we know, don't we, at the time of Jesus' um, crucifixion, people got, uh, were raised uh, from the grave. They were walking around Jerusalem. They died again and went back into the grave and will be and will be resurrected once more when he returns, when he appears, when he returns to set up God's, God's kingdom. Chapter 2 and verse... 12. As we're talking this morning about water and about baptism, you've been baptized into the name of Christ. It says, Ever we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And so when we are baptized, figuratively, we have died in the water. And when we rise out of the water, we rise or resurrected into a spiritual life. First, we are natural. And then we become spiritual. And it's not the other way around, is it? And notice there the emphasis on God who has raised him from the dead. And this is what this is all about, isn't it? Everything is centered through the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us on that cross. You see, men may be able to kill the body, but in the resurrection, the life will be given back to the body. So what about immortality? As I said before, you will not ever find the word immortal and soul together. But in the first book of Timothy, he talks about immortality. And if you want to know about immortality, we can only look at it in the Bible, what the Bible tells us about it. And he's very blunt uh, in verse 7. Uh, For we brought nothing into this world, and he's certain we can carry nothing out. That famous expression, just to dust, ashes to ashes, isn't it? And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And in verse 11, he tells us that we have to flee these things and to follow after the righteousness. You know, as we already um, heard it said, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And by doing that, we can become godliness or we'll follow God and increase our faith and our love and our patience and our meekness. 
it's a process, isn't it? Baptism is just the start. And then there's a journey. And in verse 14, he tells the disciples and the believers to keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The appearing is coming back, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto him, uh, unto whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting. Amen. We don't have immortality. Verse 16 tells us that. Who only has Im immortality dwelling in the light, which is unapproachable by man? We are not immortal in any shape, sense, or form. I have to go to Romans, Romans chapter 2. Verses 6 and 7. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek. Those are there. Seek. What, do, what should we be seeking for? Glory and honour and immortality and eternal life. It doesn't come our way. We have to seek for immortality. And that's the difference, isn't it? We do not have an immortal soul. Why should we seek for immortality if we believe we've got an immortal soul? Well, it was quite clear that we have to seek it, and it will only be given uh, by God. And verse 16 tells us, in the days when God shall judge the secrets of them by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, there is judgment to come upon this earth. So how about you? What's got to be done? And we know, don't we, it's, it's, it's baptism, isn't it? And in Romans chapter 6, just a few pages on, you see it uh, in verse 3. Knowing ye not that so many of us were baptised into Jesus Christ, were baptised into his death. He's talking to the believers, isn't he? And verse 7 says, well, when you were buried with him, it was like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So we have this figure, and there's lots of figures on that about baptism, as we were mentioning uh, this morning. But really, the key verse is the last one. For the wages of sin is death. That's what we earn. We deserve to die. But the gift of God, it's a gift, we don't have it, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's through God and Jesus that we can have eternal life and, imm and immortality. We don't have it, and we never will in this natural life. But we do know that if we do pass off the scene, those who have been baptised into Christ will be raised from the dead. And will be judged if found worthy, will have eternal life and immortality in the kingdom. And so let's go to shall we to Ephesians and chapter two. Ephesians two, verse eight. For by grace are ye saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of god it's a gift that god will give you if you could if you are if you become baptized and follow him but it's through faith through faith faith comes by hearing and hearing by god's word that's the only way we can be saved is through reading his word by reading it more, our faith will 
uh, increase. Verse 12, he says, that at that time you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And that's what he was talking to, about to these Ephesians who didn't have, know anything about Christ. And now they have been brought in to the commonwealth of Israel, centered on the promises that uh, were given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, back in the Old Testament. And so verse 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. And so we become fellow citizens in the household of God. And we have to keep in that household of God and to encourage one another on the way to God's kingdom. Let's go, shall we, to our reading that we had in 1 Corinthians 15. This chapter is known as the resurrection chapter. And we can see the importance of all of this is centered around Christ. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And it's remarkable, this wasn't that long after Jesus had ascended to his father that people in Corinth were saying that there was no resurrection of the dead. So Paul had to come and teach them and tell them that this is the foundation of the Christian gospel and hope and message. And it's through Christ. And Paul keeps on mentioning this throughout Corinthians throughout his epistles of the importance of the resurrection. Verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ isn't risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. He says you're losing the plot. Verse 20 tells us, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And just in those few verses there, he expounds it, doesn't he, in the reading that we had read. You see there, in that from verse 42 to 49, we see that which is first is natural, and that which follows is spiritual, isn't it? The resurrection of the dead is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. You can't have it the other way around. You can't be spiritual before you're natural. And natural, we are born with. And we have to progress. And by reading God's word and understanding his gospel message and getting baptized. We can become a new being, a spiritual being, rising out of the waters of baptism to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also are the heavenly. And as we are born the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And that's what we hope and wish to happen. We have been born into this world, but we also want to bear the image of the heavenly when Jesus returns and if we have been found accepted uh, into uh, the kingdom. So are the dead really dead? Of course they are. But there is hope. And the hope is here, centered through the Lord Jesus Christ.
who gave his life for all of us.